So I'm starting this vlog or this podcast, or I'm not exactly sure what to call it, but I'm, I'm starting this thing <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm starting this thing. That's, that's probably the best way. <laughs> <laughs> what a stupid way <laughs> to start something. <laughs> oh, mm. Hey everyone. I'm starting this vlog or podcast. I'm not exactly sure what this is going to be. But I've had in my mind that I've I've been wanting to do this, whatever this happens to be. And I've been wanting to do it for quite a long time. And there's been a few things that have been keeping me from doing that. Partly uh, that I've been having a hard time figuring out exactly what this is, but also just various fears of putting my thoughts out on the internet. I've been thinking about uh, wanting to talk about spiritual things and talk about the Bible and talk about uh, my thoughts uh, about those kinds of things. I, uh, I spent five years as a full-time preacher. I grew up in, in a church and uh, I've, I, my life has been fairly inundated with the Bible, even though I'm, I'm out of full-time ministry at the moment. But it's still, it's still a big part of my life and has been a big part of my life. And it seems like there's something that I have inside my head that I have been wanting to share with other people. So I'm kind of going into this half blind, which maybe is not the best idea, but I would say that the I, the things that I'm going to be presenting or, or the things that I'm going to be talking about are half formed ideas inside of my head that uh, I'm trying to give words to. So I'm not trying to proclaim any kind of um, authority or expertise and necessarily in the things that I'm talking about. Just it's uh, the thoughts that have been going through my head that I, I, I need to put into words and that I need to um, work out. And so I'm using this as an opportunity to help refine my thoughts and um, share them with other people that maybe would benefit from uh, that working out. And uh, I also realized that in the process of talking about this, I needed to talk about myself. I need to talk about my own spiritual journey in a sense and my own relationship with these passages that I, I'm going to talk about. So a good amount of what I'm going to be talking about in this is also um, very personal to me and my own personal journey. So, uh, but that, that's going to take a while. There's, there's a lot of twists and turns in my own personal journey and, um, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. If I feel comfortable after this experience sharing more after saying all that, that I want to talk about the Bible and spiritual things. The first, uh, actual book that I actually want to talk about is Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, which maybe sounds like a, a, a weird choice, but hopefully, uh, it'll make sense once I get to it. Um, I, I grew up as an army brat. I, I was born in West Germany. My father was in the army and just happened to be stationed there at the time. And uh, I lived in a lot of places in the United States as well. And uh, third grade, uh, or well, bef between second and third grade, we moved to this little town called Weston, Missouri, which is uh, a rural town outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, it used to be on the Missouri River, 
uh, before the Missouri River diverted sometime in the 1800s. And, uh, and it was just this small little town of like 1,400 people. And we moved there. And I remember, I can't remember if it was that summer or the next summer, but we went to the, the library, which was downtown. And it was in, it was in this uh, corner store almost and in this rickety old building that had two stories and you had to climb up these creaking stairs to get up to the second story of the library. And it was just packed full of books. And I remember um, one, that one summer, whichever one it was, they were either giving away books or selling books. I can't remember at the moment, but uh, I got I, I got this copy of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, and uh, I, I like I can remember that part really clearly, and I read it. And um, at that age, that that's a hard book to read at uh, at almost any age, but at that age. Uh, especially, uh, and I don't think I, I, I remember, I remember enjoying it, but I don't remember understanding it completely. If that makes sense, I read it, but I don't know that I understood it a lot, but, uh, that started, a, a kind of a love affair of Mark Twain, uh, with me. And in one sense, uh, because Mark Twain spent a lot of time in, uh, I mean, he was a Missourian in Hannibal, which is on the other side of the state and on the Mississippi River. But it was, you know, a small town, Missouri, um, a lot of steamboats and other kinds of things to that that go along with that. And and um, I think it was in reading Huckleberry Finn when I was a young boy that cemented m the idea that. Uh, if there was any state that I would call home, it would be Missouri. And uh, well, and just to give you context, I currently live in Alabama, so I feel like uh, I'm I'm not necessarily where my heart is. And um, it was through the writings of Mark Twain that I really I found somebody that I connected with. And and in the writing of Huckleberry Finn, I I found. Uh, even though Huckleberry Finn was much more, as a character, was much more ornery than I ever was as a little boy, I I, I found things in in him in that as a character, especially the honesty, the the um, the honesty of the character that really um, that was really appealing to me. And so uh, Mark Twain has always been one of my favorite authors since then. And, and I've read Huckleberry Finn a couple more times since then. Um, and uh, the last time that I read it, which was sometime in my 20s, um, I, I feel like I actually probably understood the book a lot better than I did. And I came across the sentence that um, I probably, the earlier times that I read it, I wasn't able to really understand it. And, um, but when I came across it in my twenties, it's one of those, uh, it was a sentence that I, I, I think, and I would say is one of the most brilliant and funny sentences that I've ever come across. And I know that I'm already going to disappoint some of you by saying that, because once I read it, you're going to say, really, that's the funniest sentence that you think that there is. But I, um, well, you know, what can I say? <laughs> it's, it is what it is. Just to give you a little bit to, to get the context of this, of this sentence, this is when uh, Huckleberry Finn has taken the escaped uh, slave Jim down the Mississippi River, and they encounter various peoples and have various adventures along the way. Uh, and eventually they come across these two vagrants who are hucksters, and they get to be known in the in the story as uh, the king and the duke because they claim to be English or not English European royalty, and um, and and if you don't know, Huckleberry Finn is written in the voice of Huckleberry Finn, so so it's a very uneducated um, 1800s uh, voice that is is given to the book, but the so. Uh, Huck 
Jim, the king and the duke, they, they come to this one town where there's a funeral happening. And so the king and the duke decide that they're going to try to claim to be um, uh, relatives of this, of this deceased man to try to get the inheritance. And so there's this funeral scene where the king and the duke, they're making these speeches and they're doing all these kinds of things. Well, one of them, I think, pretends to be uh, uh, mute or deaf or something in, in it. So one of them's making these speeches and, and Huckleberry Finn is, is, um, is watching all of this and, and the, the townspeople are moved by this grand display. And then it comes to this one sentence and I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. and I'll try to avoid the twang that you, that you typically, it's, it's hard not to read anything from Huckleberry Finn without a twang, but I'll see if I can do it. And the minute the words were out of his mouth, somebody over in the crowd struck up the doxologer, and everybody joined in with all their might. And it just warmed you up and made you feel as good as church letting out. Now, like I said, you might be thinking that's that's the funniest um, sentence that you've ever read. Well, let me, I, I just want to point out a couple of things. So when um, Huckleberry Finn says the doxologer, he's talking about the doxology, which is a, a very famous hymn uh, that is that was sung by a lot of churches and still is sung to this day in a lot of English-speaking churches. What I loved about it is this idea. Huckleberry Finn is this young boy who doesn't like church. He doesn't like rules. He just wants to be a kid. He just wants to have adventures and, and enjoy life. He doesn't like all these things, but, and, and, and so he has this experience that is just so joyous and wonderful that he's trying to find something to explain what it's like, what that feeling is like, and the best feeling in the world that he can possibly uh, come up with is when church lets out. And that's, that's funny because uh, on one hand, because of the juxtaposition, because of what causes that feeling within Huckleberry Finn is that it's this spontaneous singing of a gospel hymn that gives Huckleberry, feel, Huckleberry Finn the feeling of church being let out. Like that's how wonderful it makes him feel. And so there's this this juxtaposition of a very church-like thing or spiritual thing happening and then uh, a, a very unspiritual person um, trying to describe that and describing it like church being let out. But then also on top of that is I can remember feeling that way when I was like 10 years old. I, I can't remember exactly how old Huckleberry Finn's supposed to be in this uh, in this novel, but he he's around that age, and um, and I remember feeling that way, and I know that a lot of kids feel that way about church. Is like the best part of church is when it ends, and um, I know a lot of adults that feel that way, but wouldn't be as honest as Huckleberry Finn is about that. They would. They would they would know that it's wrong to feel that way about church. Huckleberry Finn uh, either doesn't know or doesn't care that it's wrong to think that way. He thinks that way, and so he says that he thinks that way. And um, and then a lot of adults that feel that way about you know church letting out, then they just stop going to church. But I so the reason I wanted to bring up this sentence is because I think it will frame maybe part of the discussion that I want to make going forward. It's, it's this juxtaposition of the spiritual and how I ought to feel with how I really do feel. And uh, maybe you feel like, well, I, I ought to feel one way or another when talking about spiritual things. Maybe I'm not too honest with myself. Maybe, maybe I feel the best when I, when church lets out and I know that that's wrong and therefore I suppress that. And I say, no, I shouldn't feel that way. And, um, but then also on the opposite end of, uh, of the spectrum is the people who, 
who are honest about their feelings of church, but then something spontaneous, some spontaneous spiritual experience happens and um, they don't have the vocabulary or the, the toolkit to adequately um, deal with that spiritual experience. And uh, so they know they experience something like here, the, the crowd just spontaneously sings the doxologer and, um, and it makes Huckleberry Finn feel so good. And then also on this is, is the fact that um, the reason that this was so spiritual was in part because it was, you know, it was heartfelt, even though in the context of the story, the people are in the middle of being swindled. They don't know that they they're just they're thinking about uh, this, the funeral. They're thinking about the, the person who passed on. They're feeling good. Um, they're feeling a lot of different things and they just spontaneously sing a hymn. It's the, their spiritual a response is a honest, heartfelt, spontaneous kind of thing. And church doesn't always feel like that. Church often feels like a chore and doesn't feel spontaneous at all. And that's probably part of the reason why church often feels um, like a chore to a lot of people. And, uh, and, and we don't tend to like chores. Chores are things you get through. Chores are things that you have to do that you don't really want to do. And, and there's something inside of us that says that church really ought not be that way. Even those of us who found value in church, church still ought not be that way. So I want to think about this, this juxtaposition between the spiritual and the non-spiritual and how closely related they seem to be. And then um, the, the dissonance that we feel when it comes to church and how church ought to feel or spiritual things and, and, and how to explain these spiritual things and, and just, um, talk about a couple places in the Bible that have not the same juxtaposition, but similar juxtapositions, um, when it comes to those kinds of things. The first one that I want to talk about is in Genesis chapter 16. So in Genesis 16, um, we come to this story of Abraham and Sarah. And uh, just just as a note, at, at this point in, in Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah are still known as Abram and Sarai. Their names are changed later on, um, but they're better known as Abraham and Sarah. So I'm just going to use those names and, um, and hope that y you understand. And I'm sure that you will. Um, Abraham and Sarah have been uh, have left Ur of the Chaldees. They, they're they now traveling through the, the land of Canaan. And uh, Abraham's been given these blessings and given these promises of blessings, of of uh, descendants and uh, a land and all these and all these things. But at this point in time, they've been wandering for a while. Abraham and Sarah are old, um, past the age of uh, having any children of their own and they don't have any children. And so the question is, is, well, how is Abraham going to be the father of so many descendants if he doesn't even have one? And so, uh, Sarah comes up with the idea of using her servant Hagar to, uh, have a child with Abraham. Now at that point in time in the ancient world, uh, this, as, as far as I'm, I'm aware and, I, and my understanding is, is that this was at least a semi-common practice. I, I would say that it's pr akin to our modern m surrogate motherhood. Um, that's not to say whether that this is a moral practice or an immoral practice or, or uh, something of that sense. The, the Bible doesn't really go into that in, in Genesis. It just says that this is what they did. And um, it causes some problems. So maybe it wasn't the best idea in the first place. But it's just, it's what they did. Maybe they were following ancient customs, maybe. Um, or uh, I, I doubt that Sarah would have gotten that idea just on her own. But it probably, she just got it because 
that was just what people did when they needed children and they didn't have any is that they they had a surrogate mother uh, who could have children. And so Abraham uh, gets Hagar pregnant. But after that point in time, Sarah uh, seems to grow jealous of Hagar. And Hagar seems, at least towards Sarah, seems to grow a little bit haughty that, because she has, uh, she has, she's the one with child. And so Sarah um, complains to Abraham, tries to get him to kick Hagar out. It says that Sarah mistreated Hagar, not exactly sure uh, in what way, but if it was just verbal or if it was uh, some other um, mistreatment, but it says that Hagar then fled. And she flees out into the desert and she gets to this pool. Um, and that's where Hagar encounters uh, this character called the angel of the Lord. But I want to, before we talk about that, I want to just talk about you know, where Hagar is and, um, and the circumstances that brought Hagar to running away. If you think about Abraham and Sarah in the context of Genesis is that they are the quintessential people of God. God called Abraham out of the earth, the Chaldeans. A God called Abraham out of all the other people on the earth at that time, God made a special promise and covenant with Abraham. God uh, did all these things and he made promises uh, eventually to Sarah as well. And, and it's through Abraham that God was going to have uh, the, the nations of Israel and uh, the Messiah and all these things that would come through Abraham. And Abraham is uh, considered the father of the faithful and um, and all of the monotheistic religions of, of the world point back to Abraham as, uh, in a sense, a founding father of their religions. We, we call them the Abrahamic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Abraham is an incredibly important figure, uh, a figure that, um, that speaks of a, a person whom, uh, is a follower of God and is called by and ordained by God. But from the perspective of Hagar, Abraham is somebody who used her and then didn't defend her. And Sarah is someone who also used her, then, um, then changed her mind and mistreated her. And, and, and Hagar was so mistreated by these people that she felt like she had no option but to leave, to run away. And, and if you think about like Hagar's circumstances, she doesn't have very good circumstances. Uh, she's in the land of Canaan, but she's an Egyptian. So she's a foreigner. She's unmarried. Um, she's pregnant. Um, in the ancient world, uh, being a woman unattached, uh, run away from her, her masters, um, uh, pregnant and, and unmarried and all this other stuff. Like she doesn't have very good prospects and now she's out in the desert and, um, how is she going to feed this baby? What's she going to do? How is she going to take care of herself? Like, uh, and, and, sh and she's been put in this position in a sense because of what the people of God, Abraham and Sarah, did or did not do for her or to her. And, um, and it's at this point that she sees the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord or the angel of Yahweh is a character that appears multiple times throughout the book of Genesis and, and throughout uh, other places in the Old Testament. And uh, usually, according to uh, various Christian uh, interpretations, uh, it's usually believed that the angel of the Lord is a figure of uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. So it's, it's Jesus before he uh, was incarnated into human form. But, um, but that's a whole other topic that we could talk for a long time about and, and look at. And maybe, maybe I'll do a video about it at some point. But even if, if the angel of the Lord isn't the pre-incarnate Christ, uh, just from reading 
uh, the various places in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord appears, you can see that the angel of the Lord is a very important figure and uh, speaks with the authority of God. And, and, um, and this is the first time the angel of the Lord appears in the Bible. It's to this woman, this foreign, used and abused, pregnant, unmarried woman who has no prospects, who's been uh, chased out of her own home and has been abused by the people of God. So here it's kind of like uh, God comes down to set things straight, to, to, to help out this person who's been abused by his people. And, uh, and the angel gives uh, various promises to Hagar. You know, at that point, up to that point, God's been making promises to Abraham. Uh, but God makes promises to this Egyptian woman who's been abused by Abraham and Sarah. And after that encounter with the angel of the Lord, verse 13, Hagar says, or verse 13 gives Hagar's response to this. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. You are the God who sees me. You know, what I get from this is that um, even if, what I get from this is that uh, we can't really um, get away from the inadequacies of people. Even people who are or claim to be the followers of God even if they are good people 99% of the time, they are people and they're going to let you down and they might let you down in awful and terrible ways. And, and saying that they're 99% good is probably an overstatement. Most of them are not nearly that good. And um, maybe a question we have is that, does God see, does God see the abuse that I've, encountered or does God even care? And, uh, at least in this story, Hagar says something like, and, and she, she, um, that encounter, she, she sees something. She sees something about God that, um, that God sees her, even if the people of God don't see her right? She was an Egyptian. She was a servant. She was somebody just to be used. That's how Sarah and Abraham saw her. But God saw her as something more. And um, so one of the things that I've thought about is that, you know, there are a lot of people who have been used and abused by the people of God or by people who proclaim to be the people of God. There are people who have been used and abused by the church. And, um, and that's, that's an awful, awful tragedy. And, and maybe that's due to blind spots. Like, I wonder if it was a blind spot that Abraham and Sarah had to servants or to, or to something like that. Like that they didn't quite treat Hagar like a, like a person. And, and maybe there are people, you know, maybe that's some of where that abuse comes from. Uh, but it's not all of it. Um, sometimes it comes because they're truly evil people who proclaim to be people of God. And, and you get abused and you get hurt. And uh, your only feeling is like you have to run away. And there's a lot of people that have run away from the church. And I, I, I'd be honest... Or I'd be dishonest to say that I haven't thought about those things at times too. Is like, maybe I should just run away. And uh, one of the questions that comes into my mind when you when dealing with that kind of stuff is, does God see? 
and God does see. God does see. And um, it's like, it's when Hagar re-encounters God, in a sense. Now, for I, she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Perhaps re-engaging with God outside of the context of Abraham and Sarah can help you see the God who sees you, perhaps. This has been going long, but I, I want to also talk about another passage that has similar connotations, but a slightly different flavor. Um, in Matthew chapter 17, there's this event called the Transfiguration where um, Jesus, um, well, I'm, I'll just read it. I'll just read it. Starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 17, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now here, the, the point that I want to make, there's, there's a lot of things that you could talk about with the transfiguration, but the point that I want to make here is that Peter, James, and John have what maybe you could call a spiritual experience. Like they see Jesus transfigured before him. Jesus is shining with a light. They're, they're on this mountain. They see Moses and Elijah conversing with Jesus. Uh, the God the Father uh, speaks from heaven to listen to Jesus. And like, you know, th this, is, this is a miraculous, spiritual experience like no other. And some people, when they have such a big spiritual experience, like it changes their life and uh, it makes them an uh, on fire believer in Jesus or, or whatever their spiritual experience happens to be, because people have spiritual experiences of all sorts and all kinds. But um, when people have that kind of experience, like it changes them, it, it, it turns them into somebody else with uh with a conviction like they've seen what they believe and um and i don't know about you but people who've had that are really intriguing to me because on some level maybe i wish i had something like that something that i could hold on to firmly and it's like this is an experience that i had and i know that i had it and 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 it's, it, it was so profound and so moving that it affects me. But the thing is, is that Jesus only did that for three people. There were a lot of other people who never saw that, including us. And Jesus even tells them not to tell anybody until a certain amount of time has passed, after Jesus has been raised from the dead. But so... We're going to juxtapose this, this grand spiritual experience of Peter, James, and John up on the mountain with something that's happening down at the bottom of that mountain. It's, it's the same time it's happening down at the bottom of the mountain. And uh, so picking up in verse 14 of Matthew 17, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they came to the crowd 
a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. So do you get what's going on here? This man, as, as Jesus is being transfigured up on the top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John looking and the Father, God the Father proclaiming from heaven on the top of the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain, this man who has a son who suffers from seizures comes to the disciples of Jesus, the people of God, the people who claim to know Jesus. He comes to them hoping for help for his son. And his son has, has such a horrible disease. He has seizures that cause him to fall into the fire, to fall into water. Like these seizures are going to end up killing his son at some point because his son's going to get burned or going to, going to drown. And so this is a serious this is a serious problem, and, and, and this man shows great faith in Jesus because he brings his son to be healed. And Jesus is, is busy doing something else at the moment, so he goes to the next best thing. The disciples of Jesus. Surely, if Jesus can heal, then the disciples of Jesus should be able to heal. But the, the man's problem is that he brought them to the disciples of Jesus but they could not heal his son. How does that describe so many people? They come to church or they go to the disciples of Jesus looking for healing, looking for spiritual awakening, looking for edification, looking for something. And the disciples of Jesus let them down. They don't find what Jesus offers with the disciples of Jesus. I say that and, and, and it, it troubles me greatly because I know that that is an experience that is not uncommon. And it's one that I've, I've experienced too before. Jesus responds and he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, Jesus isn't talking to this man. And I say that because later on, Jesus uh, directs who is the ones who have no faith. Jesus is talking to his disciples when he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. It's not the person who's looking for healing's fault when the people of God let them down. The people of God should be the ones <laughs> that help these people. And so often is the case that the people of God fall way, way short. Maybe it's because they're unbelieving and perverse. You unbelieving, this is verse 17, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You know, often... The people of God are not the best stewards of the gift that God's given them. Usually, we're not always the best representatives of God. We claim to have been saved and healed by God. We claim to believe that his commandments are true 
and we claim that it's best to live by them, and we don't always. Often we feel short. And Jesus tells the disciples something interesting that they need to have, if they, if they just had faith as small as a mustard seed. Now mustard seed is a very, very small seed that grows into a, a, a fairly large plant. And, and Jesus has, has parables about that at other points. But he, you know, he says that like, even if your faith was just a speck, even if you just had a speck of faith. Perhaps the people of God, perhaps we don't think Jesus can really help people. Or perhaps maybe we also don't find healing or the things that we need in church in church. But the people who are there are just there because they're afraid or because their parents went there or because they feel they have some obligation to go. Perhaps the people who are there in church don't actually believe that church is very effectual for them either. Maybe they just go through the motions. Maybe we, maybe I, just go through the motions. And maybe, you know, and and maybe we can't be as honest about church and our own experiences with church as Huckleberry Finn was. We know that we ought to. <laughs> we ought to be better people. We know that church ought to be an uplifting experience. And so when it isn't, we make excuses. Instead of looking to ourselves. And examining as, whether, as to whether we have faith. So I didn't expect this to be as much of a downer as I thought it would be when I started. <laughs> Although maybe I should have, maybe I should have known when I put this like small little outline together. <laughs> um, but I hope it's things to think about. Uh, whether you go to church or whether you don't, I hope that there's things there that are, that make you think. Uh that uh, give you something to think about and to, and to strive for. Maybe this is a good place to begin because I'd rather, I'd rather start in a place of honesty that doesn't necessarily feel good and, and, and move from there. Like if you read the book of Ecclesiastes and you just read like the first few chapters, it seems like the book is just a huge downer, but it gets better. And hopefully, uh, as we go through, if this was interesting to you in any way, um, as we go through, hopefully, maybe, hopefully we'll, we'll uh, experience a few more highs <laughs> as we go along. Um, but that's also like, um, to give you an idea of where I plan on going, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about my own experiences, how I got to where, I, where I've gotten, why I find Jesus and the Bible compelling, some of the pitfalls and the tribulations that I've experienced, some at the hands of people in the church, and uh, some of the wonderful highs and, um, and experiences that I've had, um, also oftentimes from people of the church. Not usually the same people, but um, it's not one-sided. And um, and if if you found this compelling or interesting in any way, I I thank you for listening. I I know I've gone pretty long, but um, I just hope wherever you are, 
in whatever situation you are, if you've gotten to the end, I thank you profusely. And I just, I want to take this time to bless you wherever you are. And I pray that God helps you wherever you happen to be in your journey in life. Even if you don't believe in God, I sincerely pray that, um, that you will be well and that um, and that if you're searching i uh, i pray that you will find what you're searching for and perhaps you'll find out that what you're searching for is a who all right until next time thanks guys <laughs>